we're really proud to have the 26th annual uh, Los Banos competition. I didn't realize that we were, uh, uh, I didn't realize we are in competition with the uh, International Ham Launch Glider Festival, but uh, we're neck and neck, so uh, Gary, we're hoping we can uh, overtake you in one of these years. Um, but anyway, we're going to be talking about Los Banos, which is a, uh, a, a scale event, arrow toe, and I think slope, did you use sloping as well? Always. Slope. E e slope. Either or, slope or arrow toe. Okay, so scale. let's get into it, and it'll be informal, informal talk, and I'll, I'll ask some questions if we, uh, uh, if we you know, keep it on track or whatever, but uh, let's just get started with Lindsay. So anyway, bringing up that point, uh, the reason it was moved uh, to this weekend, uh, the, this, this year, the 27th, it's always traditionally been the third weekend of April for many years. And uh, Easter fell on that, so we thought, well, we're going to have conflicts. People have beaten their ham or turkeys or whatever and having their family over. So that sort of threw it off. So your ham lunch, if you have it the same uh, weekend, the fourth weekend of the month, then there shouldn't be a conflict next, next year. So it's kind of unusual. Easter tends to float around quite a bit. So anyway, as I uh, was saying earlier, this is the 26th year um, of the Las Banas scale event, and uh, I decided to do that in uh, 1992, at the end of 92, when I was up at Eagle Butte in Washington State. And uh, so I came back, and it was that uh, spring that uh, Sean Sharif and I, we got out there, and it was just a handful of people. It was kind of informal. And uh, it, it was, that was, I think that was the rain, sleet, snow, we were thunder. We in Washington sitting by the Columbia River and said, yeah. could you return home? Yep, <laughs> Las Banas, uh, first time out there. We used to fl uh, uh, race there a long time ago with slope races. So Rich Spicer, Jerry Rana, a lot of the old guys in the club, uh, they, they were doing slope racing and I didn't know what it was about and we used to go down to Las Banas and that had to be in the late 70s, I think. Probably 79, 78, 79, 80. And uh, it's such a lovely sight that we'd always kept that in mind. And uh, uh, Mick uh, Carlin, a club member from many years ago. Matter of fact, Mick Carlin, I think, moved to San Diego is what I'd heard years ago. Um, but he was into thermal and uh, a lot of bent wing birds that he flew. But he always told me for years, he says, you need to do a scale event at Los Banos because it was such a terrific uh, place to fly and the scenery, flying over the lake, you can look off and, you know, this time of year you can see snow and the low Sierras and everything. I mean, it's, it's a very uh, different place to fly. But uh, anyway, uh, it's been going along pretty good. We've had a little bit drop off in attendance in the last few years compared to what it was. Um, uh, most of our problem uh, surrounds the problem getting tow pilots. And we used to have a, a number of tow pilots and unfortunately a few of them have passed on. And uh, some have gotten older I think and maybe don't feel confident towing. We have a few, uh, uh, I want to say new guys. They've been probably doing it for us for 10 or 12 years. but. Uh, we're always looking for a tow pilot to, you know, give us a, a rest. Uh, people, when they, if you're a pilot and you want a thermal and fly your big scale bird, you just, you get in line again and you just keep going around and around and I don't know how some of these guys deal with it. They tow for a good portion of a whole day and it's just one after another and after another and sometimes they'll try to put gas in almost while their engine's idling, you know. <laughs> it's... People are uh, stacking up to, to fly. But anyway, it's been, uh, you know, originally this started out as a mostly slope and thermal or sloping off of thermals off the hill. And it started out as an event to be uh, scale, but PSS was a big portion of it. But that was actually before PSS got popular in the United States. You'd always look in the European magazines. RC world, model world, and you'd see these fantastic PSS planes that were very scale looking. Right, oh, power slope scale. So you take a P-51 Mustang, you maybe modify the wing a little bit. Um, whenever I got mine going, it, it, 
I, I put a rule in later that was a 10% rule. So you could stretch the wingspan 10%. I had an ME109, so I stretched the wingspan 10%. Um, I increased the wing cord, I think, on the tip 10%. And you could just sort of cheat it a little bit, but the idea was to keep it looking as scaled as possible because uh, what we were seeing a lot was these foamy, a foamy Zero and a foamy Mustang, and, a, and they all looked the same other than the paint scheme that was on it. And I was trying to encourage people that, hey, you know, it's more work. It's not going to fly as, as well as some of these really lightweight little foamies. But that was sort of the challenge, you know. Uh, I had a Canberra bomber that I flew, and uh, the ME109 flew excellent. And I used uh, an old sailplane uh, airfoil, a 6060, uh, SD, Selig Donovan, 6060. Uh, low drag, very good performer, though, and it would carry weight. And I used that on a few different airplanes. It worked excellent. So anyway, over the years, it, it evolved. and. Aerotow is becoming more popular. We always used to read about it back on the East Coast. You know, there would be big Aerotow events. And I remember at the time just thinking, yeah, they're flying five-meter sailplanes. You know, it's like, man, that's just huge. And I think the last time I was down at Visalia, there were guys flying seven-and-a-half-meter planes. You know, so it just, it, everything has changed and evolved over the years. And uh, probably accessibility is probably the big thing that changed because I remember there were just a couple of importers into the US and we used to dream about all the European gliders and the, the technology, the sailplane quality, fiberglass work was excellent but there, there weren't uh, anybody uh, producing that kind of a plane here in the US. And uh, then uh, Jerry Slates uh, started up Viking Sailplanes which actually was a British company and he was knocking out fiberglass fuselages for people and uh, I think he was cutting cores for a while, but he would recommend to other people cut their own wing cores, and he was basically a fuselage producer. So over the years, we got more experimental and trying planes. It was a little intimidating at first. These seemed like absolute monsters to fly. But in truth, the bigger they are, the better they fly, and actually they're easier to fly. They're not so jumpy and twitchy, and, uh, and so... Um, so what, plane, we, like what are likely planes we'll, we'll see this bigger? Well, you'll see everything from vintage, you know, like I still have my old TG3 Schweitzer glider that I built, um, I don't know, it's got to be probably 38 years ago, 40 years ago, I don't know, it's a long time. I still have it, and it's very lightly built, and it was a Jack Heiner plan that was in AMA magazine years ago, and he put a bear graph inside of it because he set the 3,000-something foot altitude record and that little bear graph needle was going on that little drum piece of paper so he could prove <laughs> how high he was and you just think how the technology is now you have your transmitter in your hand and it's telling you from the airplane oh you're at 2,000 feet or whatever you set it up at so many meters you know you're at 500 meters and so anyway uh, You'll have things lightweight like that. Like I always take it every year and I tell people, bring something lighter scale that will fly on the slope if its slope uh, lift is, uh, maybe it's blowing 10 miles an hour or something and you want to fly something, you can fly. And then later in the day when the thermals are popping, you need to have your aerotow plane. So uh, there's always a good turnout uh, doing both. Uh, the way we've arranged the field now, we take off the point heading northwest, basically. And then on the far right side, on the face uh, of the long face of the hill, uh, running east-west, uh, that slope usually works. It may only be blowing five miles an hour, eight miles an hour. So the point of the whole event is to go out and have fun. It's a fun fly. You know, we're not judging things other than we vote for pilot's choice, which to me, is better than any other kind of thing. You know, you got your fellow flyers and they're judging your, you know, we have uh, modern, uh, vintage, and uh, overall, right? Best overall, I think. So it's going to the looks and not the flying? Uh, well, everything's taken consideration. How well you've built the plane, how, it, how you fly it and everything. And um, we don't like having hangar queens, so you can't bring out something real pretty and sit it there and, and get a trophy, you know. But uh, we, want, we want everybody to participate and have fun. 
And uh, I've been dragging guys in from my club, and the cameraman's one of them years ago. Um, he says, I want to come over and see what that's all about and everything. And he was new to gliders, and I think I actually worked on a scale glider for him, and, and it was new, but he was excited, and, and he brought somebody else. And um, they go, wow, this is really different, because they're used to seeing jet turbines fly or big gasoline-powered airplanes. And uh, I said, no, this is, it's, it's real quiet other than the tow plane, you know. It's, it's a very graceful, relaxing, it's a low-key thing. And uh, like I said, the, uh, the scenery is hard to beat. It's, uh, it's just a lovely place to be. And uh, then uh, it got heavier and heavier in the aero towing. And PSS sort of dropped off. And it almost seemed like PSS uh, interest overall died down. And I'm probably talking 15 years, 17 years ago, it started to wane a little bit. And, uh, uh, you know, if somebody had one showed up with a, uh, a scale PSS, I'd probably let them fly it in between the scale flying. Or at the end of the day, we tend to open the thing up. What happens is uh, it's a dawn to dusk uh, permit to fly the site. And uh, usually the wind... Uh, it can be kind of dead during the day, but a lot of times around dinner time when people take off, they say, I'm hungry, I'm going into town. And we say, don't leave yet, because a lot of times, 5.30, 6.30 in the evening, it's like you open the door over there in the reservoir, and all of a sudden, 20 miles an hour, right up the bowl. And uh, it's, uh, it's quite an experience. And you can fly the big scale stuff and all that. We try to... Uh, control how the pattern you're flying in there. And most people have been coming for a long time. Get along with each other because we have very expensive airplanes and we don't want any mid-airs. Every once in a while something will happen. But we've set up the r landing runway. If I'm facing the slope, we're taking off that direction. Then off to my right and down the hill, there's a east-west landing runway. So it's an emergency thing. So they're towing to my left and going off the hill, but the line breaks, something happens, you can pop off and you can whip a turn and go back there and land east-west. And uh, it's, uh, it's to keep the conflict down. We used to have guys fly, trying to fly the slope where we arrow tow off of, and it's just too dangerous. So uh, we let guys fly slope on the far right and arrow tow on the left, and uh, it's worked a lot better these recent years. So, and I think as everybody comes every year, I, I, I almost don't have to explain anything anymore. People, people are used to the way things are set up. And we're very lucky to have this uh, state park to fly at. It, it's, it's just a tremendous setup. And, um, you know, they maintain things. And there's, you know, an outhouse there. And they got trash cans and, and all that. And uh, uh, lately, people have been showing up earlier in the week quite often. So um, we used to collect parking fees. And that helps pay for the park and the maintenance and, and all that. But uh, now when you arrive, you drive down to the face of the dam and you pay for your parking down there and you put the sticker in your car. And uh, you go up to the hill and uh, they'll have the gate unlocked so people can, if they want to, they could camp out there. You pay a camping fee. So you could be a day person. So uh, I can't remember what it was last year. It was like... Seven bucks for the day and ten dollars for the day, and it was like fifteen or something for camping. So some guys would show up there, get out of their car, and they set up a little tent, and they'll sleep in the back of the, you know, in the in the tent. And uh, we had a couple of years ago, uh, some of the guys we came out the next morning. They said, "You should have been here last night at ten o'clock. It was a full moon, and everybody was flying the slope at a full moon." And I, that had to be amazing. They, they said the visibility was great, and, and uh, I guess it was kind of warm. It, it wasn't too uncomfortable. Well, this time of year, we never know for sure. Uh, I was concerned uh, this year moving uh, the time being too hot. But like I said, we had the Easter conflict. And uh, usually every year, it's usually raining the day before or two days before we start the event. And I'm always sweating it worrying about the event coming off. Uh, if the road gets soaked, where we park and everything uh, gets a little too wet, the uh, parks will close the gate and you can't get in. Can't get in. What they're worried about is they've had people from the town 
And these guys come out with their four-wheel drive pickup trucks and they do donuts on the runways and stuff and make these big ruts and just destroy everything. So uh, anyway, uh, we haven't had it canceled permanently. It, we've had it rain on Saturday a little bit sometimes and then we come out and fly Sunday and you know, usually you know, when the storm blows through, the day after the storm blows through, it's awesome. You know. But we've flown on the same days as Quits. Yeah. Up. And it blows through, it kind of funnels through the valley there, so things kind of move in and out kind of quick. So, so, so for people who don't know, how do you, how do, you uh, do an aerosol? I and mean, what's the process? Well, you know, it's usually, you know, it's, uh, it's some kind of big wing, uh, sort of lighter wing loading plane, Hershey bar wing, right? So constant cord thing is good a lot of times. That's so a Piper Cub, a Piper Cub, an Ag Cat, a big Cetabria. Uh, Something that's over engined, engine, usually about 100 cc is, is what you'd expect to see because there's a lot of these planes, they weigh 28 pounds or 32 pounds and they, they can get up there and be, it's a, it's, it's a weight and drag. <clears throat> but uh, once they get in the air, they don't need the power. It's, but if you see the guys launch, we've, we've had a couple of guys that their whole launch method is take off and climb up at a 45 degree angle until you reach 1500 feet. So, it's cycle time. <clears throat> Get up there and then cut the throttle and do a dive right for the ground and uh, try to get as many people in the air as quick as you can. But there's, li there's a line on the, uh, usually somewhere around, uh, d behind the CG on a, on a high wing plane, let's say, at say, say near the trailing edge or something. And there's a release there and that's servo actuated. And then you have a release in your glider and that's servo actuated. And the reason for that is uh, safety, so if, if one of them malfunctions or if there starts to have some mayhem happen, which it can happen, somebody turns right and the other guy's turning left, uh, uh, you can pop off and sometimes you can see somebody start to get into trouble and I always pop off and then I tell them I popped off after I've already left because there's not a lot of time to think about it. You know, you, you don't want to, you can have a scale plane, I've seen some sort of do this and hang and they start dragging the, the tow plane down and he's sort of basically doing a hover and pop pops the release and uh, but yeah you're being towed up and I prefer the old-fashioned scale looking ones where you go out you do you know gentle s turns and you're climbing the whole time and uh, seeing the plane can be a problem sometimes you know you get out there and you're looking at a, a edge of a wing tip and you just don't see your wing you see your fuselage but you know, it can throw you, you know, and it can be off one way or a little bit, but you're not sure, gee, am I banked a little right or am I banked a little left? So um, it's, uh, it, it takes practice, but when I first started doing it, I would just tow up to like 900 feet or something, so something was close, and it was like maybe half the height of a normal tow. And then I'd go down, catch a little thermal or something, circle around, practice a landing or whatever, and you get, get more com uh, comfortable with it. Uh, the tow plane, uh, of course, it has wheels, and then your glider has a wheel usually. And, and if your uh, sailplane doesn't have a wheel, it isn't uh, necessary that it does, uh, usually somebody has a cradle there. So it's a PVC pipe, padded foam thing. Uh, looks like a little go-kart or something, you know. It's got four wheels on it, and you can set your wing right up against the front pipe. And you take off, and usually you're not going very many feet and your, your glider's lifting off and, and the cart just rolls on and somebody retrieves it. So you're not dragging it through the, the rocks and the dirt and all that. Uh, it's a little rougher environment. You know, it's not a grass runway like Visalia is. And uh, that, you know, you literally could drag your fuse on the grass. It would be, it, you know, it'd be off the ground so fast that Yeah, it's a, it's a dirt runway, and like I say, most of us do have retractable uh, wheels. Yeah. And uh, um, so, anyway, you tow, you, tow, you tow up, you've got these release safety things and all that, and there's always somebody to advise you. So if you're new to it, or you think you're going to be intimidated by it, there's plenty of people there to explain the whole thing. You can watch how people are doing it, and it's it's... It's easier than you think. It, it looks intimidating if you've never done it. And, and sometimes things are happening fast. The plane gets off the ground, and you see them wigwagging the wing a little bit, and you're thinking, wow, that's, that's kind of hairy, you know. 
but it's, it's really not too bad. Um, you know, having your plane proven, it, a lot of guys will do that. They'll, they'll have a new glider, and sometimes they'll wait until the slope comes up, and they'll chuck it off the hill and test the trims, get everything adjusted, make sure it's working okay and everything. Uh, a lot of guys will just say, hey, I know how to aero tow. I got the balance right, just go for it. And uh, I didn't have a chance to test fly my big five meter ASW 27. And I went out there and took off and it was, it was fine. It was actually easier than my four meter ASW 27. So, but uh, uh, the thing that's different with the scale planes is probably striking to most people that get in that have flown anything. And I mean, I don't care what else you've flown. The efficiency on these huge planes and high aspect planes is unbelievable, you know. And that was probably one of the harder things when I moved in these bigger gliders. I'd come around the land, I'd set up out there, and you come in and you come in and you're hitting the spoilers a little and you got the flaps cracked down and trying to judge how far it's going to go because generally speaking, it glides a lot farther than you think it's going to go. Um, at, at the site, you're standing sort of uphill where you're standing to fly and it, the valley drops away down there and I've had my times where I've landed in the weeds out there and the planes are so huge you think, man, I thought I was going to be just on the other side of the road and I'm out there 200 yards and landed in the weeds. The wind picked up or I hit sink or something, you know, and it's like, well, I didn't judge that very well. So I've tried to get more courageous on my approaches and come in higher. But the landing site, uh, the runway length is not super long. It is uphill, which is good. So if you touch down early, you're rolling uphill, and that generally slows the plane down quite a bit. But uh, judging that can be a little tricky. And if there's a headwind, it's tough to judge. You've got to think, no, I've got to come in farther. I've got to come in much deeper in to before I hit the spoilers. And the, the spoilers are phenomenally effective. I mean, you know, uh, it kills the lift. Uh, Fantastically. So, are, do you buy a plane, or do you build a plane, and what's if you were going to buy a plane, what's what's the beginner? Aero tow? Well, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, you know there's the, the old foamy ka sixes that were made, and I can't think of oh, yeah, uh, layered where those disappeared. But they guys would fly some of those and everything, and they'd tape them up and everything, and it was just a simple ka six, yeah, foam ka six. But they they flew they flew really well and and all that and. I can't remember whether anybody actually put an aero tow hook in one of them, but yeah, it seems I like, did. You, did you do yeah, it? A lot of guys would slope them and everything. But you can start out inexpensive like that. You know, World Models made, uh, uh, Minimoa. yeah, the Minamoa, and it seemed like they came out with something else. But there's some ARFs that are available that you can buy that are uh, more old timers. And if you're kind of a moderate pilot, you're still learning stuff and all that, you're more comfortable with thermal planes and all that, Hey, you can get some of these vintage gliders. They got sort of a flat bottom airfoil. They got big wing area. They're real brightly colored, so it's easy to see. You know, it's not seeing this white, white airplane out there in a white sky, bluish, hazy sky. So, um, you know, the vintage ones are neat. Uh, to me, I don't, we don't see enough of them out there. They're, they're, they usually have nice paint schemes. They're unusual, and almost all of them fly really well. Um, the more modern glass ships, you know, to some degree, they all look alike. You know, they're all they're all white, and they got different marking on them, and uh, but they're very efficient and fly really well. But that's where I would start, is I would do some kind of a vintage kind of sailplane, and uh, you know, uh, when we were first doing these scale gliders years ago, we used to winch up our scale planes. My TG3, the first flight on it, was on a winch, which is frightening because it's so strong and it had dual hooks on the side of the fuselage and there was a tow bridle that, uh, and you're trying not to snap the wings off because you know, only had like a 5 16 wing rod, a, a metal wing rod. But you'd, you'd tow up and you release. They're not as efficient as a light thermal plane, so you know, you're up at uh, 250 feet and you're saying, okay, I gotta find a thermal really quick. So, but uh, we used to fly those at, uh, Curtis uh, Elementary School, there were a few of us doing it back in the day. And uh, so if you bought something that's a vintage type plane, you could fly it on the slope and light, w light wind. You know, you could go up to Coyote Hills and fly up there. Or even 
I don't know, do we still have that park up in Fremont, up the yeah. uh, mission, the mission, that low ridge there or something, especially if you had the, an antique type plane, it would fly there just fine. You know, some of the big uh, glass ships, they kind of scoot around fast and make big turns and, you know, you get something that's vintage and you can kind of hover it a little bit and, and do this where you probably wouldn't get away with that with a, a big glass slipper, you know. We register on site. Yeah, we used to try to do all this time ahead of time and online. Almost nobody would do that, and I, we came to the conclusion a lot of people will decide to come to the event at the last minute. So there's a pending possible conflict with something, and a lot of times it's been the weather, and the guys from South uh, uh, Southern California, they'll, they'll call up, well, are you going to hold it? And I go, like I say every year, we're going to be there. It's going to happen whether you're there or not, and oh, well, what about the rain? Well, I can't predict the rain. So you show up, and, and we've never actually had a total washout on a weekend that we didn't fly. You know, maybe there's part of the day, and yeah, Walter. We did have a fire. We had a fire. That was exciting. Yeah, a guy flying an electric uh, whiz-bang like a, a baseball bat with little short wings and uh, started a fire, and we bugged out in about, what, 15 minutes? We got out of there before our cars got incinerated. But uh, that's the thing up there. There's fire hazard uh, when we have a very dry season. I think this year it's probably still going to be green up there, but um, when it dries out, a lot of tall grass, so we're real strict on not allowing smoking. We had somebody charging batteries on a, on a canvas or something near their trailer, and it popped or something and started a little fire with it. Just, it was just a few feet. Everybody jumped on it right away. But uh, when you look south, like 30, 50,000 acres that away, you know, of grass. So it's, uh, yeah, so it's real important to be safe. And that's what we have the park mow everything down, you know, so we can park. There's a center parking area. And not too much stuff grows there. But uh, you have to keep an eye on it. But like I said, it's a tremendous sight. But uh, if you're coming out, if you're coming out to see it for the first time, you could come out. Friday guys will be flying there. Sunday guys will be flying there. Some, but Saturday is the day. A lot of guys work, and some guys will show up late in the afternoon. Maybe they're taking a half a day off and they drive in or something. And uh, so Saturday is the big day. And you know. Than yeah, we don't usually have the pilots meeting until nine o'clock. So time we but it means they're there, they're there, they're there. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere around lunchtime is a good time to show up, you know, and and Bruce usually is cooking dogs and burgers and that kind of stuff and so I haven't talked to him about what, what the plan is for this year. But uh yeah, Saturday um was is always our biggest day and Sunday used to be pretty good, but I've noticed over the years that Sunday has been dwindling away to n near nothing, but a lot of guys that come up early in the week, and then we have a lot of guys that come from Southern California. So, you know, they may stay and get up Sunday morning, and they maybe get a flight or something, and they pack up because they've got a seven-hour, eight-hour ride to get back home. So, so I understand. But uh, then on the other hand, like I said, there's some guys, they show up Wednesday, Tuesday, and they'll say, hey, you should have been here three days ago. The lift was phenomenal. So it's always unpredictable. Some years it's more of a slope flying event, and recent years it's been more of a, of a thermal soaring event. But that's like I've always said, bring something light that will work the slope, and then bring something that you can aero tow. And there's no reason you can't spend the whole weekend flying. I mean, there can't be those odd times where the wind doesn't blow. We've had guys damage their tow planes, so there isn't a way to get it off the ground. And uh, so we're, we're always interested in having experienced tow pilots show up. It, it, uh, we've got a pretty good group of guys that have proven themselves over the years, so you have faith in what they're doing. And uh, it's, uh, I, I, I would say generally speaking, because I run other contests in the power club and all that, uh, competition has just sort of been dying down, all of us have been noticing in recent years. It's not... There's some key contests. I mean, Visalia is probably as bigger than it ever was. But uh, 
a lot of the little contests around here, things have just died off and, and it withers away. People get other interests or, they're yeah, they're flying drones or whatever it happens to be, you know. Uh, flying site acquisition or retention is a, is a real problem. Uh, the Tomcat field that I fly at, it got washed out from the floods from the dam and <coughs> this December will be our third year that we have had no access to our field other than bicycling in. So there's a bunch of us that have made trailers. We haul our, I haul a, almost a 90 inch Spitfire with a big air pump and a battery and starter and gas cans and all the equipment behind my mountain bike. And we go down the trail two and a half miles, we fly all day and then we bicycle two and a half miles back. But uh, uh, a number of fields have been shutting down and that's a problem. It's hurting the, it's hurting the uh, hobby shops and, and, and the hobby in general. Uh, uh, Aero Micro, which is local here, uh, Perry is, he says since the field shut down a couple of years ago, his business is just psh, taking a big nosedive. Because guys go out, they need props, they break a prop, they, they, they broke a wing on one of the ARFs, a battery pack went bad, so they come in, hey, I need another replacement battery pack. And so we're seeing that cascade effect, flying sites, sites affecting the hobby shops and affects your building, and then if, well, where are you gonna have a contest, you know? If you lose the site, then that club that used to put on a, a, a vintage meet or, or a little pylon race or whatever, people will move into other things, and it's sad. Uh, it, it's just the evolution of the society around us more than the hobby, I think. I think if there were plentiful flying sites, I think you'd see a lot of people in the hobby. But uh, 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 EBRC went away. Bayside has been in and out of activity, and they're out. They're out now. When they were open for about a year, uh, permitting with the city of Newark. It's politics. It's weird. It was a, it was a great little place to fly, and it was convenient for everybody, and uh, not a contest site, but. But uh, you could probably have like a fun fly there or something. But uh, anyway, I just keep soldiering on with this. And, uh, you know, years. so 26 years, yeah. So as long as you're having fun, you know, that's the idea. That's the idea of the whole thing is I, I've been saying for 30 years, I wanted to fly scale. And even my model uh, fighter planes or power planes, I didn't want to fly sport planes. I want to fly... Spitfires and Hurricanes and Fock Wolves. I want to fly ASW-27s and TG-3s. Scale to me is, is where it's at. It's, they're beautiful things. And it uh, doesn't mean you only have to do that, but I love scale. And so I've tried to sustain the hobby in the scale glider event. Uh, we're kind of the only thing on the West Coast, I think, other than just some informal things that happen. And, of course, Visalia, we have the, the monthly arrow toe down there. And, uh, but it uh, used to be just kind of an East Coast thing year, many, many years ago. So. Also, questions, guys? Any thoughts? We can use help on Saturday. If you want to come over and you haven't seen, uh, a lot of times it's just helping. We're, we're trying to collect money from the people and fill out some paperwork and for a couple hours until everybody's registered. And then we have the pilots meeting. And then it's just an open fly as much as you want. And nobody's telling you when to fly or not to fly. It's, uh, it's open flying and fun. And it's nice to get together once a year. You see these people that you only see some of them once a year. And you see their latest project. You know, they tell you what they're working on. You find out what's available. Hey, so-and-so's importing a such and such a glider. And uh, it's cool. It's... Uh, Fun experience out there, different, very different from flying other powered airplanes and stuff. Will there be a group of teachers? Actually, we haven't had to worry about that the last uh, number of years. Everybody's 2.4, but there is an occasional person that shows up, and Brian Ch Chan used to show up with the, the little uh, clothespin clips that, that had your frequency. But now what we do is we just say, hey, bring your own pin and we'll, we hook something up there, so if you do have something on 72, which 
I don't know when I last saw somebody on 72. If you're on 72, you're nuts, you know. <laughs> so it, uh, Gary has a question. Uh, yes. Gary? Yeah, yeah, Lindsay, uh, two questions. One, I remember, you know, last time I was out there a long time ago, uh, you used to have winching as well as arrow toe and slope, and the winching, you know, kind of died out relative to arrow toe, but I am just curious if anyone still does it. That's my first question. I've got another no. question. I'll wait for your answer. No, they don't. Uh, we've had guys sometimes set up a high start. Uh, I think we've occasionally had somebody bring their own winch to launch a more of a slope performance type plane, you know. But even that's died down now, and everybody's got a, a little electric up and go. <clears throat> and, you know, they'll stand there on the slope, and, zzz, and they get up there 60 feet, shut it off. And then they, they go back forth, and the wind dies down. Well, they just buzz back up another 100 feet. And uh, so, yeah, the winch hasn't been necessary for years. And I don't miss it exactly, because it was always a crossing up, getting into people's planes and... and you know, yeah, getting uh, cut by the line. Go ahead. And second question. Second question was, um, I remember when it was so popular, you, had, you used to have to have like half hour blocks of uh, PSS and then, a, right. and then a vintage block and then a, then a, a fiberglass block. Do you, do you do it that way still or is it just kind of everyone fly at the same time? It's no longer PSS, so that sort of solved the problem. It dropped, it dropped off quite a bit, and we saw an upswing in actually scale gliders, uh, scale sailplane. And so a couple of guys would show up once in a while. Um, the site's sort of unpredictable, and some guys gave up because, you know, you show up and it might blow like hell one day, or it might not blow that much during the whole weekend. Uh, so guys would go to other more predictable sites if, as far as the PSS version of it and everything. I still think it's a cool thing. I mean, I, at one time I thought about running a separate little PSS thing. You have to pick a different time of the year, maybe March, maybe early March or something. Uh, like we're, right now we're starting to get winds here, which is sort of typical March into April a little bit. It can be windy. Kind of late season, right? Yeah. But, but that's what's unpredictable is, is the consistency of the wind blowing. And uh, that's, that's why that happened that way. It evolved. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Okay. Any Come on up. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Right. Uh, okay, well, thank you, Lizzo. All Appreciate right. it. Sure. Yeah.